And the interesting part is the recent study has suggested that this annular foresight infection is more likely to cause periodontitis in overweight women than in normal weight women. So according to another recent study, overweight or obese individuals have an overgrowth of this uh, microorganism tangular forsythia compared to normal weight individuals, thus subjecting overweight or obese individuals to a higher risk of developing periodontal disease. A very interesting and important finding, isn't it? Hi, hope you guys are all doing good. So let's continue with our paper discussion videos. So before I proceed, you need any additional information or you need any clarification, just leave a comment right beneath this video and we'll make sure that we're updating those clarifications or additional information in the description part of each video. And also we have been trying to divide each video into number of or multiple topics by adding timestamps in the description part of the video. So you need any further information, any further clarification, or you need specific details about the contents of respective videos, just go through the description part of each video. Okay, so let's continue with our paper discussion videos, and I hope you guys are ready. So let's start with Cydex. So what is Cydex? 2.4% glutaraldehyde solution. And let me review some additional information for your benefit. So Cydex activated dialdehyde solution is a fast and effective way to disinfect and sterilize a wide variety of medical devices and instruments, chemical sterilization. So Cydex 14 day use a 2.4% alkaline glutaraldehyde solution destroys almost 99.8% mycobacterium tuberculosis in 45 minutes at 25 degrees Celsius. And Cydex OPA, the one which is being projected on screen, OPA stands for orthophthalaldehyde, is compatible with a wide range of medical devices. Requiring no activation or mixing, this Cydex OPA destroys mycobacterium tuberculosis in 12 minutes at 20 degrees Celsius. And also I found some additional information in one of the articles. Cydex 2.4% glutaraldehyde is used for chemical sterilization, which is commonly used to sterilize instruments in between cases, where we use four trays, one tray for keeping Cydex solution and then the other three trays for sterile water. Sharp instruments to be kept in activated solution of Cydex for 15 minutes and then washed three times in sterile water kept in those three trays. Effective against vegetative pathogens in 15 minutes and for spores, three hours. So glutaraldehyde, as you guys are aware of, it's irritant to eyes and also can cause allergic dermatitis or asthma. So handling should be done with PPE, which is mandatory. And once mixed, they are usually good for up to 14 days. This is very, very important. And solution should be replaced anytime they become cloudy. Okay, now let's move on to our next question or topic. What's the use of nickel in stainless steel? So in this particular table, you can clearly see uh, the types of stainless steel and their composition, including percentage. So austenitic seems to be containing more amount of nickel comparatively. So addition of nickel to iron chromium carbon composition stabilizes the austenite phase on cooling. So this is the objective of adding nickel in austenitic stainless steel. So type 18H stainless steel contains 18% chromium and 8% nickel by weight, which is most commonly used alloy for orthodontic stainless steel wires and bands. Consider this a very, very important and also the composition, be familiar with the same. Now let's move on to the next topic. This we have covered uh, just before the exam in the form of one of the quick revision classes and also we try to cover the same in our e classes and test series including discussions. So different types of wedging techniques, wedge wedging, double wedging and piggyback wedging. Let me review some information given in Sturbrands for your benefit. So double wedging refers to use of two wedges as you can see in the central part of this screen. One from the lingual embrasure and one from facial embrasure. The two wedges help ensure that the gingival corners of a wide proximal box may be properly condensed. They also help minimize gingival excess. So the objectives of double wedging. So double wedging should be used only if the middle two thirds of proximal margins are not able to be adequately wedged. 
and any amalgam excess that forms in the facial and lingual corners is accessible to carving and therefore proper wedging to prevent gingival excess of amalgam in middle two thirds of proximal box is the primary objective. And then we have piggyback wedging onto the extreme right. The technique allows wedging near the gingival margin of preparation when the proximal box is shallow gingivally as we discussed previously and the interproximal tissue level has receded or in both the circumstances, right? So the technique to allow wedging near the gingival margin of the preparation in the proximal box is shallow gingivally. The interproximal tissue level has receded or both. And then to the extreme left, you can see wedge wedging techniques. So another technique may be used on the mesial aspect of maxillary first premolars to adapt matrix to the fluted area of gingival margin, right? The concave or the fluted area. So these are different wedging techniques and their specific indications, right? I hope it's clear. Now let's move on to the next topic. What's the significance of S wave in ECG? So we have some terms like electrocardiography, electrocardiograph, electrocardiogram, etc. So make sure you have clarity regarding those terms. So normal ECG consists of waves, complexes, intervals, and segments. And waves of ECG recorded by limb led to are considered as typical waves. Normal ECG has the following waves, as you can see in the illustration P, Q, R, S, T. Eindhoven had named the waves of ECG starting from the middle of English alphabets P instead of starting from the beginning A. So if you have a question like Y starting from P, then you should be asking the same to Eindhoven. So major complexes in ECG, P wave, the atrial complex, QRS complex, the initial ventricular complex, T wave, the final ventricular complex, QRST, the ventricular complex. So each wave has its own significance. Uh, let's uh, just confine to S wave. So S wave is due to depolarization of the basal portion of ventricular muscle near the atrioventricular ring. So the amplitude of S wave is around 0.4 millivolts. And to simply put, S wave signifies the final depolarization of ventricles at the base of the heart. So that's the significance of S wave in ECG. If you need any additional information, do let me know in the comment section. As I mentioned there, I'll be updating any additional information in the description part of the video. And please give me 24 to 48 hours at least. Now let's move on to the next topic. There seems to be a question on image-based question, Miller's classification of gingival recession. So we'll look into the criteria and also various classes as you can see in this particular illustration. So Miller proposed a classification system way back in 1985 and is probably still most widely used system for describing gingival recession. So this classification is based on the extent of gingival recession defects and also the extent of hard and soft tissue loss in interdental areas surrounding gingival recession defects. So we have four types of recession defects. Class one, we have the marginal tissue recession which doesn't extend to mucogingival junction. There is no periodontal loss bone or soft tissue loss. Nothing is evident in the interdental area and 100% root coverage can be anticipated in case of class one. Class two, marginal tissue recession, which extends to or beyond the mucogingival junction. There is no periodontal loss in interdental area and 100% root coverage can be anticipated. Class three, marginal tissue recession, which extends to or beyond the mucogingival junction. Bone or soft tissue loss in the dental area is present and there is small positioning of teeth which prevents the attempting of 100% of root coverage, so small positions. Partial root coverage can be anticipated and the amount of root coverage can be determined pre-surgically using a periodontal probe. Class 4 marginal tissue recession which extends to or beyond the mucogingival junction. The bone or soft tissue loss in interdental area and or mall positioning of teeth is so severe that root coverage cannot be anticipated. Right? So these are four classes as given by Miller. Four types of gingival recession. I hope it's clear. So whenever you go through any of the classification, if feasible, go through a respective illustration for convenience of your understanding and for easy remembering. Now, let's move on to the next topic. Theorems of retention, the one which we discussed in one of the previous paper discussion videos, if you remember. Anyways, let's summarize the same. So, the first, there are totally 10. The first nine theorems were given by Ryder, and the 10th was given by Morris. So, theorem one, teeth that have been moved tend to return to their former positions. Theorem two, elimination of the cause of mal occlusion will prevent recurrence. 
Theorem 3, mall occlusion should be overcorrected as a safety factor. Theorem 4, proper occlusion is a potent factor in holding teeth in their corrected positions. Theorem 5, bone and adjacent tissues must be allowed to reorganize around newly positioned teeth. Theorem 6, if the lower incisors are placed upright over basal bone, they are more likely to remain in good alignment. Theorem 7, corrections carried out during periods of growth are less likely to relapse. Theorem 8, the farther teeth have been moved, the less likelihood of relapse. Theorem 9, arch form, particularly in the mandibular arch, cannot be altered permanently by appliance therapy. And the final theorem given by Moyers, many treated malocclusions require permanent retaining devices. And that's the reason why you find permanent uh, retention devices or wires in most of the patients who had undergone orthodontic therapy. Okay, now let's move on to the next question. Next topic, a neighbor stroke, one which we discussed uh, just before the exam, in one of the preparation classes, if you remember. So neighbor stroke. So in case of multi-rooted teeth, the possibility of furcation involvement should be evaluated and carefully explored clinically. The use of specially designed probes such as neighbor's probe allows an easier and more accurate exploration of the horizontal component of furcation lesion. So as you can see to the right of the screen, right illustration, where using a neighbor's probe, you can assess the horizontal component of the furcation, isn't it? Now let's move on to the next question. There seems to be a question on a K-file cross-section. So you can find a different uh, file orientations and their cross-sections. K-file, K-reamer, and H-file from left to right. So these endodontic instruments, basically are used for cleaning and shaping as you're all aware of. So K-file, the one which is on the extreme left uh, represented by A. So K-file traditionally made from a square band, whereas B, K reamer traditionally is made from a triangular blank. And C, the extreme right head strong file, you know, it's made from circular blank, right? So it's a machine from a round blank to produce spiral flutes. In fact, we discussed the same previously. If you observe these cross sections, uh, square obviously has more fracture resistance because of four sides, whereas triangular, even though it has less fracture resistance compared to, compared to that of a, a four sided uh, blank. This triangular cross section has higher cutting efficiency. And that's the reason why nowadays all smaller instruments are manufactured via square blank, whereas larger instruments are being manufactured via triangular blank. Right? Isn't that obvious? Because small instruments tend to fracture easily, so we need more fracture resistance, hence, they are being manufactured from these square blanks. Right? I hope it's clear. Now let's move on to the next question. There seems to be one question on tandrilla forsythia. So tandrilla forsythia, it's anaerobic gram-negative short bacillus as evident in the illustration, the shape of the microorganism. So let's review some additional information regarding the same. So tandrilla forsythia is an anaerobic gram-negative member of cytophage bacteroids family, which was initially described as bacteroids forsythus by Tanner et al and later reclassified as tandrilla forsythia by Sakamoto et al. based on phylogenetic analysis. Tandrilla forsythia is associated more frequently or in higher levels with disease uh, such as gingivitis, chronic, aggressive periodontitis, etc. And you know, uh, there is an interesting finding which I'll be reviewing now. Uh, several studies have also implicated tandrilla forsythia and progression of clinical attachment loss associated with periodontitis. Consider this very, very important. And the interesting part is a recent study has suggested that this tandrilla forsythia infection is more likely to cause periodontitis in overweight women than in normal weight women. So according to another recent study, overweight or obese individuals have an overgrowth of this uh, microorganism tangular forsythia compared to normal weight individuals, thus subjecting overweight or obese individuals to a higher risk of developing periodontal disease. A very interesting and important finding, isn't it? Now let's move on to the final topic in this specific video. Pulse points, there seems to be a question on uh, artery felt on masseter muscle. So those are the keywords which I received. So obviously it has to be facial artery. Let's review some additional information regarding the same. Usually pulse is palpated on radial artery. 
because it is easily approachable and placed superficially. However, arterial pulse can be felt in different areas in body, as you all are familiar with. So, what's that artery which is felt on the surface of meseter? So, as you can see, facial pulse. Due to its superficial course, the pulse of facial artery is palpable at anterior inferior angle of meseter muscle against the bony surface of mandible. Right, so consider this very, very important. And along with that, we have some additional pulse points. As you can see in this particular table, we discussed the same in one of the study club discussions previously as well. So various pulse points to the left and uh, areas of palpation, anatomic areas of palpation to the right. So if you observe the facial pulse, uh, serial number two, on facial artery at angle of jaw. And also, I, uh, I suggest you to go through all of these pulse points and consider them very, very important and be familiar with the same. Right? I hope you got my point. So, let's conclude this video. And in the upcoming videos, we'll deal with more topics depending upon the keywords which you provide. So I hope this video is useful and as I mentioned prior, you need any additional information or you need any further clarification regarding any topic, just leave a comment and give us 24 to 48 hours so that we can update those additional points or clarifications in the description part of this video. So wish you all the best. Love you all.